Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. And we are back. Now we're going to be really drilling down over the next five podcasts on pricing listings to sell, but also getting price reductions. There's a lot of technique to uh, the things we're going to be sharing with you guys. A lot of scripts, a lot of systems. It's very important that you use the notes that are uh, below. Obviously, we try to, I think, almost always put all of our notes, right, mm-hmm. Julie? Yeah. Absolutely. In the show description below. So scroll down. All the notes are there. And uh, we're going to be really getting into the weeds with all of you so that, frankly, you can start pricing your listings to sell. And if you have listings now that are overpriced, then you can, you know, get them repositioned on the market so they correctly reflect the market's expectations. That was a script. Did you write it down? Snuck that in on them, didn't you? I did. And uh, when your hunting expires, as all of you will be doing, you're also going to be knowing how to get the prices, uh, you know, adjusted accordingly so the price, the properties will sell. So this week is very intense really focused um, on you know pricing properties to sell because it is going to become very, very tricky in many markets. Now, I'm going to start out with uh, a little bit of, we need to, I think, have a, a common understanding sure. of the difference between value and price. Mm-hmm. All right. And I'm, I'm reading your notes and I see what you're about to talk about. So I think this will fit in perfectly. It's a good intro. Right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was thinking about this last night, how to explain. Um, so Julie and I, you know, when we socialize with people and, you know, go to parties and just talk with all of you guys, just run across everyone. People make the mistake constantly of saying there's some sort of or alluding to or believing that there's some sort of big, you know, price or value erosion that's going on. Value erosion, not price erosion. Value versus price. That's where I'm going with all this. Because back in 2007, 8, and 9, there was value erosion. The values of the properties actually dropped below what people paid for them. So there's a difference between pricing and value. So get this clear in your head. And then I think you'll, I, it'll give uh, your mind room to uh, be open to the thoughts that we're going to be sharing with you in a second. So if you have, like, I'll give you an example. Julie and I had, uh, let's say, uh, if we had a car for sale, and let's say we put the car for sale for, you know, 50 grand. And even though the market tells us that the car is worth 30 grand, like every single comp, every single, you know, thing that's out there is, is telling us that car is not worth 50, it's worth 30, right? You guys with me so far? And then we eventually, in order to get the pro- or in order to get the car sold, we have to adjust the price down to thirty. Did we lose twenty grand, or did we just finally price the house correctly? Do you guys get the difference? And so, what a lot of people are believing is because they have to price their properties correctly, that the properties have lost value. No, they didn't. They lost value maybe in your head, <laughs> right? right? Right. They didn't actually lose value. The difference between so, for example, if we'd uh, bought that car for thirty grand, let's say. And we were selling it for 15 grand, then yeah, we lost 15 grand. That's like what was happening in 2007, 2008, 2009. Well, mostly seven and eight. The definition and, of a short sale. You're right. selling it for less than you owe. Well, a short sale, you're selling assuming it for less owe. than you owe, or exactly, assuming you owe, like you just said. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the whole moral of the story here. So, please don't think this is anything like the previous market, which I'm teeing you up perfectly. <laughs> exactly. As we have said, pricing is the hot topic all week because it's a big, hairy topic. We'll take a look at the factors causing price reductions, what to do from a listing agent's perspective, as well as what to do when you're representing a buyer. And we're going to dive into some price reduction scripts and give you the confidence you need to navigate the changing market. So let's first take a look at what's happening to prices right now. And no, by saying that, we are not talking about the market crashing. Just as Tim said, the market is not crashing. It is simply normalizing. So here are the facts, hot off the presses, nationwide. One in every 15 listings had a price reduction in the past 30 days. That's about six and a half of active list, six and a half percent of active listings in the country. However, some markets have seen 50 percent of active listings get a price reduction in the past 30 days. So let's compare those two. Nationwide, it averages out to six and a half percent of actives got a price reduction last month. But there are many markets that it's quite a bit more severe. But so what this is, when you see this kind of statistic, we've seen this before. Julie and I have been doing this for decades. And what this is um, kind of a, I don't even want to, I don't want to be overly critical, but this is essentially sellers 
who have unrealistic uh, expectations as far as what their homes are worth. We call it aspirational pricing. Mm -hmm. And frankly, this is another, you know, this is evidence of agents that don't know how to actually properly price properties. In other words, they're just taking the listing at a uh, elevated price. Uh, maybe they don't know how to go about setting the price correctly in the first place, or maybe they don't want to, um, you know, they don't have the skill set being blunt to get the property priced correctly in the first place. So when you see these kinds of widespread statistics, and especially something like 6%, which is a pretty meaningful number, honestly, sure. when you see numbers like that, that is essentially the market still adjusting to the new reality. That's the sellers adjusting to the new reality. And that's also the agents having to learn how to adjust to the new reality. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Dr. Filling, their sellers, you know, well, learning how to. Right, exactly. Yeah. This, this type of information, when you see these types of statistics, this is 100% uh, proof that the market is still very much uh, adjusting. Now, also take into time, uh, you know, take uh, when you're considering all this, what time of year it is, what's the, you know, what interest rates are doing. And so these types of things in a cyclically adjusting market, the, the numbers will go up and down pretty radically pretty fast. So just adjust mm -hmm. accordingly. This information is as of two days ago. That's right. Now, the five metro areas with the highest percentage of listings that got price cuts this is the percentage of listings that had a price reduction. When I give you these stats, these percentages, that doesn't mean they're coming down by that percent. That's just the percent of overall actives that had to have a price reduction. So that's Wenatchee, uh, Washington State, Idaho Falls, Idaho, Carson City, Nevada, and Austin, Round Rock area, and Waco, Texas. Those were all in the 50 to 54 percent of active listings came down. Again, that doesn't mean they came down by 50%. It just means half of the actives had a price reduction. Now, she took that sort of sampling because obviously price reductions were happening all over the country, but she was using that to show the fact that it's happening in these completely different unrelated markets. That's right. So unlike before, you know, when the market was super hot for several years, kind of the whole country moved about the same way. We were all going rapidly up in price. We all had multiple offers basically on anything. All it had to do was be available. Well, now we're seeing markets kind of stretch apart, and what's happening in the ones I just rattled off is different than, say, Florida, which still is pretty strong. So you have to know your actual market. Now, this is all happening. All these price reductions are all happening at the same time that prices are still up by at least 3% this year and are expected to end up averaging about 5% higher by year's end. This figure shows you that we are normalizing, not crashing. A crash would not have price increases. Okay, so that's worth, we really need to drill down on yes. that. So listen to what Julie just said. Be very, very clear in your head. There were no price increases. There were no value increases that were happening. It was value, basically. That were happening uh, during 2007, 2008. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite, right. Properties in some markets dropped by, you know, 40 plus percent. That is not what we're experiencing. Year over year, what Julie just explained to you all of you guys, is that in many markets, prices went up. Values of properties went up by at least 5%. Yes. So despite what the headlines and all the clickbaity things and all the news channels and all the rest of it are leading you to believe about real estate, guess what? If you own a home, it went up by probably at least 5% this year. Exactly. Okay. Now, remember, again, we're proving the point that we are adjusting and normalizing, not crashing. Remember this, at $52 trillion, the total value of homes in the U.S. is up, get this, 49% since before the pandemic. That truly is insane. Yes, 49%. So these price adjustments won't be catastrophic to most sellers. We're a very long way away from short sales, so don't go thinking the sky is falling. Okay, so again, worth drilling down. Prices are up by almost 50%. In the since last, 2019. It's since 2019. Now, what you're seeing now with the price uh, adjustments or the price uh, reductions, essentially, that many markets are now experiencing, remember, that still is, uh, you still had 5% increase in value in the last, you know, 12 months. So you're looking at properties in many markets that have increased by at least 50% since 2000, you said 19? Yeah, since pre-pandemic. Okay. Uh, so that is a substantial, massive increase. Now, the value of those properties, there's no reason to believe, and it's incredibly important, you're really clear in your head about this, that the values of the homes are going to somehow regress back into, say, 2019 values. No. And I read that sometimes from people that are, I, I just, I don't want to come off overly negative, but they really piss me off 
because they don't use any real factual information. No, they're only using their thought that, well, you know, prices were going really high in 2006 and five, and so then there was a crash, and since prices have gone up, there must be a crash. That, they, that's not based on any underlying factors. None. It's just basically, well, that's what it did before. That's what it's going to do now. It's no. basically yo-yo thinking about, you know, there's going to be another uh, bubble that's going to burst. There's no reason to believe that's true. People, the same people who've been predicting that since, again, 2019, they've been wrong year after year after year after year, and they're going to continue to be wrong that's because right. nothing is the same as it was back in 2007. Well, that's why we're facting them, right? Yeah. Okay. So look, look at the runway though. Okay. So a 49% increase since pre-pandemic, you know, the average and not every single listing is having a price reduction, but when they do, they're still only coming down by less than 5% on average. So you've got that remaining, you know, 44% left to go before you're even Steven with 2019. There's just so much runway there. Now, are there isolated instances where people refinanced, took a bunch of equity out, didn't have a very big down payment in the first place, and maybe are behind on payment, Whoa. and that makes them even very, very, very randomly, literally less than, I think it's like three and a half percent of the market of closings were even uh, short sales. Oh, so along the line, those lines, um, again, you'll have this memorized because that is what you do. Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. We'll no, she will. You watch listeners. So what percent of all uh, home inventory is distressed? It's, it's like almost 4%, but it's less than 4% overall. Which is a record low for what well, period of time? Well, it's a forever yeah. Literally forever. It is a record low since they started recording it, I think back in the 80s. You remember when all the- And, and actually it's gone down. It, it was a previous low and it's actually gotten lower in the past quarter. Remember when all the naysayers were saying, well, when the COVID- uh, Forbearances. Forbearances. Though, there was going to be a foreclosure wave. Oh, well, there's one yeah. thing after another, after another, Well, after the another. same- Okay. So the forbearance naysayers, you know, there's going to be this awful, you know- backup of foreclosures due to forbearances. Well, they also said there would be a silver tsunami when all the baby boomers were <laughs> just had to sell their houses all of a sudden. And they also thought there would be an Airbnb bust. And now there are, now the new thing is as soon as somebody has to make their student loan payments, well, that means they're going to miss their mortgage payments. Yeah. So, you know, from one drama to the next, but not based on facts, no. which we like to uh, sprinkle upon you. Well, okay. it, again, the reason that we're so adamant about you guys getting these facts and the reason that we spend so much time on this podcast and our coaching program to make sure you have the actual information is because if you operate with bad information, you're going to then pass that bad information along to your customers. You're then going to, you know, it always comes down to the same thing. If you don't believe that tomorrow is going to be better than today, you're not going to take the actions today that would have made tomorrow better than today. In other words, if you believe the sky is falling, you're sure as hell not going to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. You're not going to learn to price properties correctly. You're not going to learn how to get prices, nope. you know, lower prices on homes. Why would you bother? After all, tomorrow it's going to be, you know, some sort of, you know, locust apocalypse. So you're never actually going to make tomorrow better than today. So that's really the reason that that you want to purge from your mind all of these naysayers, all these snake oil salesmen that are trying to sell you into the belief that there's any sort of anything other than, frankly, amazing things that are going to happen in the real estate markets. And here's a little foreshadowing, and we're working on a podcast about this. If you look purely at the demographics of what the United States is experiencing over the next 20, 30 years, it's extraordinary, and it's going to do nothing but maybe even uh, increase the demand for housing by something like 5 to 7x. So that's how many uh, home sales and how much new construction is going to have to be built just to meet demand. And it's going to be built and that demand will be met. And you are going to be a beneficiary of that, provided that you are taking the right uh, steps now to you know, stay relevant in the real estate. That's right. And provided that you make it through this next three to six months, because yep. it is going to be more challenging than you're used to. That's why we're talking about price reductions, because we've seen... You know, we've gotten text, we've seen videos online, we've seen stuff on uh, social media where agents were losing their minds over having to do price reductions, hearing about price reductions, having to ask a seller to come down. Okay, so... Well, you, you're yeah. to, so we're going to be giving you guys more scripts and whatnot throughout this whole week because this whole week is on this theme. That's right. So what should you do when you're the listing agent? Now that you know about this whole price reduction thing, you can price it to sit or you can price it to sell. The average mortgage payment on a $400,000 home, we use that because that's about the national average, the average mortgage payment on a $400,000 home is now over $3,000 per month with taxes and insurance. That's nearly double what it was a year ago. So any buyer still looking is serious 
motivated, qualified, and scarce. All right, let me ask you some questions about that. Sure. All right, was that 400,000 PITI or just principal and interest? You mean $3,000 payment? Yeah, that yeah, was, sorry. Uh, with taxes and insurance. Okay, so. That's the average. If you take that out, it's still about, um, I think it's about 2,700 without the taxes and insurance, but you know, you do have to pay taxes and insurance. Right, but that's a $400,000 mortgage balance with the all-in payment being around $3,000 adjusted accordingly. You we got know. it. But here's where my mind went. So if you're in a market where the average home has appreciated by or increased in value, inflated basically is really what we're talking about here, by 5%, that means that property essentially has increased by at least $20,000 yes. this year, which means that a $3,000 a monthly payment was subsidized. This is all on paper, obviously, mm -hmm. by $20,000 worth of uh, inflation or appreciation. Yes. So the house may have cost you uh, $36,000 all in, but uh, in, in essence, You're the house- You're getting 20 grand back. Now, and you might be in a market where guess what? The house has increased in value by more than uh, you know 5%, is, is, is the case with many markets. Julian? and I rental True. properties in some of these markets where the properties have increased in value even after this year by as much as 10%. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you guys hopefully are understanding with the inflation or the agents love to call it appreciation, but it's truly inflation on the property. In many cases, the inflation will more than cover the cost of the ownership of the property. So if your house payment was $36,000 for a whole 12 months and the property increased in value by $36,000 you know, for that 12 months, in essence, you live for free. Congratulations. Go you. Yes. Okay. So what you just did was a great script for a buyer's agent to talk to a buyer prospect who is nervous uh, and freaking out that when they look at, you know, what it, their payment would be on that same house today versus what it would have been when rates were lower. And they say, oh my gosh, my payment's going to be twice as much. Well, the uh, inflation is still on your side. Now, this assumes that they can qualify and that, you know, they'll sign up for that payment. The point is that the fear of missing out buyers and the, we got to get in before the rates go up, that's all over and behind us. So the buyers that are out there right now are serious. They're very qualified. They're very motivated. But from a listing agent's perspective, you have to realize that there are fewer of them. Well, rents are going to be going up as well. When that's th true. This is the thing is if you want to, you know, your housing expense, Mr. Tenant, is going to be increasing and if you know your yes interest rates are higher and your payments higher than it would have been say three years ago but your expenses regardless are going to go up so you might as well be building equity in something yes. versus essentially throwing it you know julie and i are landlords so we appreciate tenants trust we me do. we do but at the end of the day it one of the easiest ways to build wealth in the United States is to own a home. Always has been true, always will be home, always will be true. I'm working on a podcast about this, which is going yeah. to be called um, The Cost. Everybody's talking about um, you know, the cost of buying right now because prices are high and rates are high. What's the cost of waiting? And I'm going to do a comparison based on real numbers so that we can actually show that, that there is a cost to waiting because you're going to pay a higher price due to uh, inflation slash appreciation. You're going to have a higher down payment out of your pocket because that is a percentage of the price, okay? And you're probably still going to deal with scarce inventory. So let's let's get back to th what we're going to do about pricing your listings. So pricing your listings accurately in the first place will save you from having to do price reduction conversations later. Although, again, we're going to give you those price reduction scripts later this week, and you get tons of them in Premier Coaching. And by the way, Premier Coaching is free for you to join. Just scroll down in the description below. Hopefully, all of you guys are using these notes. I bet you are. And again, the notes are available on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and everywhere you're listening to us, which is everywhere, because this podcast is the nation's number one listened to daily podcast for real estate professionals. Our notes are below, and I think we can, um, we're, they're all there. So definitely reference those. And when you're reading the notes along with us as we're presenting to all of you today, make sure you do click to join Premier Coaching. It costs you nothing. And yes, you can join now. And that does include a daily semi-private coaching call with a Harris certified coach. So go ahead and do that now. It takes 17 seconds to join. You love what you learn on the podcast. You won't believe unbelievable value you get as a coaching client. So join now, costs you nothing. All right. So first, it's important to stop doing any or all of the following. I'm going to do these quickly because we've touched on these a little bit. All right. So stop taking the last best comparable, adding five or 10% and expecting to sell that listing quickly and for even more than the asking price. The good old days. Exactly. There are random examples of this, especially in the first time buyer end of things. 
uh, but they are becoming few and far between. So stop rolling the dice and hoping for a bidding war. That's not really a pricing strategy, though I know for a while it seemed like it was. Well, with that said, there might be pockets in your local market you gotta know where, your stuff. where that still works. So don't just assume there is one market. There's not any one market for the country, and there's no one market for your community. So you're really going to have to get right. good at understanding how to use your MLS, frankly. And we talk a lot about that in Premier Coaching and have done quite a few podcasts on it, but the real drill downs in Premier Coaching. Yes. Also, stop just pricing it based on what the seller wants to get unless that number can be backed up by recent comparable sales. They might be okay on what they want to get. This is usually called seller pricing and is often aspirational pricing, otherwise known as an unrealistic price. But again, before you shoot that down, look at your comps. Maybe, you know, something closed last week that you can use as a comp to justify that. But don't assume that you can just throw that dart at the wall and get it. Okay, stop using any comparables older than 90 days to justify your price. You have to keep it updated. That is what appraisers do. That's what you need to do. Okay, so on to three reasons why you must get better at pricing immediately. And some of this can also turn into discussions with your sellers. So number one, demand is lower than it's been in several years. Buyers are feeling the pinch of higher rates, which equal higher monthly payments, as well as a larger down payment coming out of their pocket. The net result of this is they are more picky and may opt to just keep looking or waiting versus writing an offer on your listings. Number two, why you must get better at pricing. New construction is popping up everywhere and builders offer incentives that most resale sellers can't or won't offer. The payment on a resale home for $400,000 is actually going to be more than on a new home for even $450,000 due to builder incentives. You can overcome this with a better price and or offering to buy down the buyer's interest rate like the builders do. And we've done podcasts and a lot of training on that in particular. And yep. not all builders offer incentives. Small, medium ones won't most likely. But the large ones, they are going to clean up because they're buying the rates down by as much as two points, aren't they? Absolutely. Okay, so as of last month, newly built homes represented an elevated share of 31% of those available for sale, according to National Association of Home Builders. Additionally, nearly 16% of total home sales last month were new homes. So that shows you where the buyers are going. Okay, so number three, resale inventory has finally just increased by 15%, which is unusual for this time of year. This means buyers have more choices, thus they have more control of the transaction. This is very different than previous years, even previous quarters. Listings are still selling for about 99% of the list price on average, but remember that that stat is based on the final list price, which may have happened after one or more reductions. And remember that many of you had average list to sell price ratios of 105 or 110%, so 99 actually seems low to you, but it's not really. Let me ask you about that one. Did yep. you hear anybody, because I've read that same statistic, but I'm wondering if, if you have differing information than me. Mm -hmm. The inf uh, resale inventory increasing by 15%, was there any reason why that was that's happening? I, I haven't read like specifically what's causing that. So, so what have you seen? The, well, I read two articles on this. And the specific reason is what you and I have been predicting, right? Because the natural demand from people that have to sell, mm -hmm. they can only procrastinate for so long. True. And then they're going to need, you know, the, it, the house has to be sold. Mm -hmm. And so there are some people that took themselves out of the market, maybe because they had lower interest rates. That's the other conspiracy theory that people are going to be locked into their payment because they have super low interest rates. Well, if you're living in a two bedroom and all of a sudden you found your wife's going to have triplets, I assure you that that low interest rate is not going to want to make you stay in the house with three screaming babies. You're going to need more room. <laughs> your motivation has been found. Right. Or if you inherit a property or if you have a VRBO that's going the wrong direction. If da, 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 well, I'll tell you from my, my coaching calls with my elite coaching clients, so, they are reasons like that for right, sure. Exactly. Me too. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're going to be experiencing. The sellers that have to sell, and this is the reason we always coach you guys to focus on being a listing agent. The sellers that have to sell, some of them were able to procrastinate procrastinate. Also, some of them were able to, maybe they were aspirationally priced. Notice we did not say uh, overly pri uh, overpriced or anything like that. We're trying to coach you guys subconsciously here <laughs> to stop using the words that offend sellers that end up getting you not hired in the first place or fired, right? So pay mm -hmm. attention to the words we're using. So ultimately what's happening is the market now as uh, the people that have procrastinated in essence, putting their homes for sale are no longer able to procrastinate. It is the natural cycles of real estate because here's newsflash for all of you. Homes were still selling in the late seventies, early eighties when interest rates were almost 20%. Why? Because people always need to sell real estate. People will always need to sell. 
Be very clear in your head. It's not always about someone wanting to, you know, hit the real estate, you know, get the Willy Wonka ticket and, you know, walk out with the chocolate factory. No, it's circumstantial. People move for real reasons. And it's again, it goes back to demographics. Yes. And the the market's catching up with essentially the half twos that are in the market and you're going to see an increase in inventory. That's right, which is by and large a good thing. Heck yeah. Okay, so what if you, the listing agent, get an offer less than the list price? Oh no, less than the list price? Who does that, right? But it is happening to a listing near you. We have a show coming up in two days where we're telling you guys how to position your sellers so that mentally and emotionally, they're ready for a market that's going to be a little bit, you know, not such uh, so much favoring sellers. You're going to have to psychologically prepare them for the new realities of the market. Otherwise, when they get an offer that's not, you know, 10% over their ridiculously overinflated asking price, they're not going to get pissed off at you and fire you for not getting the deal together. You guys get it? Or not getting an offer in the first place. You're going to have to get better at your skills and make it so that your sellers are going to emotionally be ready for, to accept the new realities. And that is going to require more of a less transactional mindset, frankly, when it comes to your listings, even working with buyers. And you're going to have to be more relationship oriented. You're going to have to be more, you're going to have to coach them and, you know, you're going to have to have better bedside manner. We're going to get into the scripts and the techniques and the systems and the psychology of that in the future shows. Well, be, in order to counsel your sellers in the way that you prescribe, you first have to get your own head screwed on straight. And, which is today's show. Which is what, why we started with this. Yeah. As often we do, the mindset part. Okay, so what if you get an offer less than the list price? Well, first of all, number one, don't assume that your sellers won't negotiate. And don't counsel them to say no to reasonable requests. It's much more likely in today's market that a buyer will expect inspection items to be remedied, for example, and ask the seller to contribute to closing costs. So don't lose deals just because you're using a hot seller's market mindset, or your seller is because you haven't had that discussion. If you have no other offers, you better keep the buyer happy or they're likely to walk away, especially if you're in a market where you're seeing more inventory or you're surrounded by new construction. Here's where this gets complicated. Yes. Let's say you're a Tim and Julie Harris uh, premier coaching client. Mm -hmm. And let's say you uh, you actually are very good at your scripts and your price reductions, getting it priced correctly. Sure. You used, used a pre-listing pack. You've pre-qualified the seller. You know the seller's motivation. You have checked all the boxes. You're a professional. Mm -hmm. And you go in there and you're competing against two other agents. Mm -hmm. And those eight agents are nothing like you. Right. <laughs> and they're actually pri overpricing it, maybe even cutting their commission, telling the seller they don't have to do anything with home and, uh, you know, don't worry about condition or basically they're uneducated. Blowing smoke. Exactly. Blowing smoke. It's very difficult right now to be the skilled agent competing with unskilled agents Absolutely. and not losing the listing mm -hmm. because you're telling the seller the truth. Right. That goes back to skills, and we're going to be sharing that with you guys this week. But here's a little secret sauce to all of this. A lot of the sellers know the truth, and if you share with them the information that we're going to teach you guys how to you know, present to the sellers and how to present it, that's the key thing. It's one thing to give somebody a CMA. Here's your CMA. It's another thing to explain to them, to break it down, to actually translate it. Translate it. That's where the key, that's where the real technique comes in in a market like this. And the magic happens when you realize that your unfair advantage comes from you actually being a professional and knowing how to do all this. You guys think that your advantage comes from your brand and your marketing and your advertising and your ability to generate leads and drip on leads. Not in a market like this, guys. In this market, it comes from your ability to get the listing sold. Because when that sold uh, sign shows up in a neighborhood where there's a lot of for sale signs, you will all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, 90 days, six months, start picking up all those listings as they uh, you know, show up expired. And the next thing you know, you're the most dominant listing agent in the, that particular marketplace. Julie and I experienced this when we sold real estate, and so have literally thousands of our coaching clients. That's the reason Julie and I love a transitioning market. Because it allows people that are real, willing to do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do it at the highest level to absolutely dominate. Exactly. All right. Well put. So point number two on what to do when you get an offer less than the list. Well, always create a seller's net sheet and discuss it with your homeowner. Chances are they're still walking away with a big bundle of proceeds, even if they have to accept a less than list price offer. When they focus on what they're getting, that's the proceeds, versus what they're losing or perceiving to lose, which is money off the list price, then they'll likely decide to accept or at least counter the offer. So don't lose it just because you're having to come in, you know, maybe accept something less than list. It is worth noting, Julie's first point, it was subtle, but were you listening? Do not offer your opinion on the price. 
Ask them what they think. Yes. So based on, you know, if we were to take this offer today and close it in 30 to 45 days, you're going to walk away with X dollars in your pocket. What does that do to your plans? Exactly. Don't say, oh, this is typical low-skilled agent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. I cannot believe the offer we got from the buyer's agent. It's an insult. It's an insult. I'm going to beat them up. We're going to bump, 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 Or worse, up. let's just not even respond. Exactly. All the while, the seller is thinking, shit, I would have taken that. Yeah. Or the agent talks them into countering. You know what buyer's agents hate? When the seller counters over list. Yeah. Because the presumption is if it's listed at 500 grand and I come in at 500 grand or even 499 isn't my presumption that they would take it since that's the price? But on the listing side, listing agents don't assume that the seller is going to want to uh, negotiate at all. They want the deal done. And don't think that your uh, highest and best use as their representative is to always negotiate. Because negotiating might result in losing the sale, which m might result in them losing money uh, because then they're going to have and another... time. And, and time because they might have another price reduction in two weeks. So please learn how to actually sell real estate in this market. Thank you. All right. Now, that was from the listing agent standpoint. Buyer's agents are asking, when is it okay to ask for seller's concessions, including price, contribution to buyer's closing costs or repairs, that sort of thing? Point number one, gather your facts and have a negotiation strategy. If the house is clearly priced right based on recent comparables and all the other ones you've shown your buyers probably... If it has a ton of showings happening and it's only been on the market for a day, well, your strategy will be different than when you find a home that's been on the market for 60 days or more with slow or no showings and no competing offers. Again, this goes back to skills. In Premier Coaching, we t I explain to you, it's very working with buyers and working with sellers essentially is the same psychology, just on different ends of the uh, tug of war. Yep. But uh, you are supposed to present to the buyer prior to uh, showing the buyer the first house. Uh, essentially a presentation, which we, you know, have in Premier Coaching. Called the buyer presentation. Called the buyer presentation, oddly enough. And in the buyer presentation, it is going to explain to you what to say, uh, how to say it to the buyer so that they understand the nature of what's going on in this marketplace right now. And you're going to give them the negotiation strategy. You're going to explain to them like what Julie just said. Like one of the scripts, I'm not going to get this perfectly right, is, you know, when you take them out for the first time, Mr. Seller, this is our Mr. Buyer. I always lean into sellers, That's right? Okay. Mr. Buyer. So I'm going to be showing you three or four properties today. And we're going to be doing what's called the floor model game. Mm -hmm. Now, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to give you, and this is assuming you're showing them the, how, the car, the car, listen to me. You're showing them the houses while they're in the car with you, which you should always do. And what you should do, let's assume there's two people. You're going to sit one in the driver's seat, one in the passenger seat. The person who's making the decision is going to sit in the passenger seat, just FYI. The person in the uh, passenger seat is going to have individual printouts of the MLS listings that you're showing on a clipboard with a pen. The person in the driver's seat, give them a map book and, I don't know, some crayons and something to do. <laughs> Basically, the person in the back seat is just along for the ride in essence. The person in the passenger seat is the one making the decision. Um, and in my experience, when you're dealing with a man and a woman, it's almost always the woman. Yes. <laughs> I mean, like 99 Typically, points, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So you're driving around and you're showing them properties. You're going to show them the first property. And before you get out of the car, you're going to say, well, before you frankly have gotten in the car in the first place, after you've given them a presentation, after they've signed the buyer agency contract, after they've signed the exclusive agency contract, you're going to say, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, here's what's really important. I want you to remember to bring your checkbook. The mm -hmm. first time we go out, because you will most likely uh, run into, we're, I'm going to show you three or four properties. I'm going to be very selective on what I show you. I'm going to show you uh, usually one that I think is a great match for your, uh, what you described you're looking for. One that is maybe a great match, but maybe the lot's a little larger than smaller than what you uh, said you were interested in. Maybe the location is a little bit different, but I thought maybe it'd be an interest uh, of interest to you. And then, then I might throw in two or three and maybe one, like a surprise one. Like you say, you're looking for contemporaries. Maybe I'm going to show you a modern, something like that. But here's what really matters. And I want you to be very clear in your head. Do not be surprised if the first property I show you is the one you want to purchase. And when you see a property and we walk in and you love the house, and if you feel it checks all the boxes or enough of them, you need to tell me, you need to say, I want to buy this property. This is the one for me because here's why, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, because there are probably 10 or 20 people that came in before you 
uh, to looking looking at the property or 10 and 20, or 10 and 20 they're coming in after they're going to be looking at that property and even thinking about it for an hour or two could result in you not getting that property. So when you see something that you like, you don't even necessarily have to love it, but if you like it and maybe you could fall in love with it over time after you change the wallpaper or whatever, you need to let me know so that we can move forward and, and purchase that property. Now, let's just say I'm going to show you four properties today and we're going to play what's called the floor model game. So you're going to be sitting in the front seat and he's going to be sitting in the back seat. And here's the MLS printouts. When we go into each property, you're going to uh, you're going to write notes on the, you know, MLS printout. Remember it's on a clipboard with a pen. If you're, you know, wanting to write notes, if not, let's just walk around and check out the property. And by the way, buyers agents, when you're walking around showing the property, shut up and get out of the way. That's your job. Walk around with them, but shut up and get her out of the way. People will like the house or they won't like the house. It's not your job to necessarily do anything other than shut up and get out of the way. The property sells itself to the buyers. You're not selling properties to buyers. The property will sell itself. Now, I know some of the more luxury properties with the listing agents have to show the property. That also, you know, that's a, a, a situation where you might actually have to sell the property if it's got a lot of intricate details and that's completely different. But for a vast majority of you, the main thing is let the people bond with the property. Let them start mentally and emotionally placing their furniture and all the rest of it. All right, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to go through three or four properties today. And the first property you're, we're going to go into, you're going, when we get back into the car, you're going to have written down your notes. You're going to, you know, you're going to actually have thought about it. Now, when we go to the second property, same thing. You're going to walk in and you're going to have your MLS printout. Maybe you take notes, maybe you don't. And then when we get back into the car, assuming neither one of these you want to actually buy, then we're going to play the floor model game. And here's what's going to have to happen. Listen to what I'm saying. You're going to, Mr. Buyer, have to choose between the first one and the second one. So you're going to look at both of the MLS printouts. You're going to look at your notes. We have just looked at these, so everything's fresh in your mind. And the one you like the least, we're going to crumple up and we're going to throw on the floor. And we're going to do that every time we see a property. And the goal is, after we've looked at these three or four properties I'm going to show you today, you're going to choose one because there's one that's going to stand out above all the others. Now, if for some reason we don't find a property that's a good fit for you on the first time we've gone out, then we're going to do the same thing the second time. But don't be surprised if I show you, if it's a still for sale, the house that you actually, the, the one that you like the best from the first trip. That will be the one that we compare maybe two or three other houses. And 99% of the time I find that people will buy a house after the end of the second trip if they haven't bought one on the first trip. So this is not about showing a billion properties and looking until the cows come home. This is about you guys finding something that matches probably 70 or 80% of what you want in a home. And that's what we're going to be doing today. So we're going to be playing the floor model game. So don't be surprised if at the end of our trip today, you're going to have uh, you know three or four wrinkled up pieces of paper on the floorboard of my car. And that's perfectly great. Those are the ones you're not going to buy. The right. one you are going to buy is the one that's not crumpled up. Now, what I just gave you guys was I, condense, I combined two scripts, and there's a lot of other buyer scripts that are all designed to help it so the buyers know they're, uh, they should make a decision quickly, that it's okay for them to buy the first house that they see, and also that you're uh, you know essentially going to help them whittle down what they're looking at. That way they don't get overwhelmed. Because if you show them four properties, I guarantee you they're going to remember none of them. They're going to blend them in their minds. And they're just going to basically, it, they're never going to make a decision. You, this is a system that Julie and I design that is intentionally created so that the, the system is doing the closing for you. You guys get that? Because at the end of this drive around, they'll only have one MLS uh, printout in their hand. And that'll be the one that they're most likely going to write an offer on. This works. Yes, but what's interesting about that, you know, we started, this is mostly about uh, pricing. But you also, through talking about pricing, which is a result of higher inventory having to be more careful about pricing, you also have discovered another thing that is a missing piece to the previous generation's real estate education, which is how do you actually deal with having to show more than one property at a time? <laughs> <laughs> we, you and I don't always appreciate that. But yes, you are starting to see more inventory. What are you supposed to do about that? And isn't the tendency going to be buyers saying, oh, well, we want to see more. We want to see more. Versus before where, you know, it was a scramble to be the first one to get in and then you had to scramble to be the winning bid and the only reason they wanted to see it was because it was available. So we're going to talk a lot more about buyers. We're going to talk about the importance of 
you know, really, really, really being selective in the buyers you're working with, especially in a market like this. Anybody that shows up in your life is looking to, you know, get a great deal. Make sure you say, well, I hear that a lot, Mr. Buyer. So what does a great deal mean to you? And if they're saying, well, I want to buy a house at 50% off, you need to say bye-bye to that buyer because that buyer ain't buying. That is a time waster. That is a looker. <laughs> that is not exactly. a buyer, but we're going to be drilling down more on this in the next few days. So guys, listen, thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate agents in at least the United States. Stay tuned in. Please do continue to share this podcast with other agents, at least the ones that you want to be successful and stay in the industry, yes. right? I mean, you know, the, the agents you don't like, don't tell them about this podcast because it will help them be more productive and stay in the business. But for the rest of them, right. and for all of you, please help us to keep this the number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. Please do give us a five-star review and a comment as to why you like the podcast. We certainly appreciate it. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs>